Hello, everyone. I'm Rich Feller from Colorado State University. It's a great honor to be here as part of NCD's first virtual conference. And as you can see from the first slide, I'm privileged to be here with Mark Franklin as well. We'd like to talk about consultation to promote so social justice and self-advocacy and the innovation behind that. We want to cover three things, who you are matters, use science, and purpose statements, and how we've used them as well as our colleagues, Crystal Mikes and Kyle Inselman, who can't be with us, both with education and also in organizations and with employers. So we hope that's a useful presentation that we can allow you to see on your own. And I'm gonna, if I can say hello to Mark, if you wanna say hi, Mark. Hi everybody, I'm looking forward to uh, connecting with you today and I'll introduce myself a little bit more uh, just in a few minutes. Rich, over to you. Great, well, thank you. So what we'd like to do is share our intentions and today we really wanna think about this as if we're consultants. And we're brought in as consultants. We encourage you to think about playing that role to promote how to help clients find their voice, how to promote social justice, and how to clarify next step possibilities, both for students as well as employees. We want to look at some theory, some research, and offer you some tips related to Who You Are Matters program, Use Science, which is an aptitude assessment and now industry recognized certification program, and also the use of purpose statements with the hope that you'll go back and replicate these as a consultant, both on private practice issues, consultation issues, and also on campus. One of the things we've learned in a lot of consultation, and Mark and I have been consulting for a number of years, is that you have to look at what's going on in organizations. And in terms of career consultation, there's a couple issues we have to talk about, both cost, access, and quality. And we call that the cost access quality triangle. We clearly know people bring us in for the whole issue around cost. And cost is really consultants help us get our services lower. We also have been brought in to talk about access. And access is really about uh, how do we reach more clients? How do we get to the more folks with less cost, and then the issue about quality, like let's get deeper, we have to have better quality. So if Mark and I can present our material relative to you being a consultant like us and taking this to private practice, we think we've got some ideas. One is to really magnify the power of gamification, make much greater use of peer support, maximize the power of technology, and introduce more self-directed tools. So with that, I want to turn this over to Mark to begin thinking about what that means relative to these issues. We're going to talk about, again, who you are matters, use science, and this notion of a purpose statement, which is the last thing. And when you talk to Mark, you're going to hear a whole lot about, again, who you are matters, both in terms of a game, some virtual experiences, and also the online storyteller. Let me turn it over to you, Mark. Thanks, Rich. Looking forward to sharing a little bit with you from the perspective uh, that I have consulting with organizations and individuals. I lead a career management practice called Career Cycles with a team of associates uh, helping individuals and organizations. Um, together with Rich, we co-founded One Life Tools to really put the power of story and storytelling into your hands, the hands of helping professionals. Um, all of the tools that I'll speak about, I use integrated and embedded into courses and programs at the University of Toronto. That's Canada's biggest university. And uh, I also host a podcast about career stories called Career Buzz. It's a podcast you can subscribe on any podcast app, and it's also a broadcast radio show. And um, I'm excited to talk about consulting using these tools. So the Who You Are Matters gamified tool and other elements within an evidence-based narrative framework um, that really help individuals strengthen their voice for self-advocacy, and also to address issues of social justice. So you're actually looking at a image there on the left of university students in a credit bearing course using the Who You Are Matters game for, for clarification. And then an image on the right of working one-on-one -on -one with an individual using the storyteller that ties up all the loose ends of narrative and brings it into a focus. Um, why would we use narrative approaches? Uh, we're hearing a lot about reflection and the need to step back and reflect on experience and learn from reflection. And so I like this quote from John Dewey, we don't learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. Of course, we do learn from experience, but this important notion of reflecting in a structured approach. And, and that's what we've been really working on is how can you use stories and narrative and experiences uh, to, to then identify strengths and personal qualities and interests and other elements that you might have used a traditional assessment for in the past. 
So can we sidestep some of those traditional assessments or at least integrate them and come up with a different approach that structures reflection? And people have argued in the past that there's, it's too complicated, it takes too much time. Um, Mike Stebleton wrote an article about that comparing the strengths and weaknesses of narrative versus other approaches. And what we've tried to do is come up with a method that really streamlines the ability to, to reflect in a structured way um, if not test and tell, or in addition to test and tell, what have we got? Well, there's a narrative assessment approach, uh, first written up, um, you can see in that 2015 article um, in Sarek's textbook. And when we talk about narrative assessment, we're talking about a structured approach to help people reflect on their experiences, um, and now from a variety of backgrounds, and having a robust approach to really helping people utilize their stories and their narratives. So we developed a narrative assessment framework to help individuals and organizations create well-informed choices. Um, to date, uh, just at our career cycles practice, we've had over 5,000 clients, and I'm proud to say from 80 countries of origin means that there are people uh, from all around the world, and this is a very robust, inclusive um, approach that works for diverse audiences. And now we've uh, consulted with organizations and trained over 1,200 people in the US, Canada, and Europe using a documented approach. Uh, we have now two outcome studies, and I'll just bring your attention down to, to them because I think it's important to say in our field to have outcome studies that support the work we're doing. Um, 2015, we published our first outcome study, um, and, and we found that people experience increased level of what's called psychological capital, which conveniently has this nice acronym, HERO for hope, being more hopeful about your future, efficacy or confidence, resilience to bounce back from setbacks, and optimism. And we did another outcome study published in 2020, again with Mike Stebleton, and we found out that we got really good results from a single session. Right? Because many people say, well, I don't necessarily have multiple sessions. So what can you do in a single session using a narrative approach blended with technology? And we did find, in fact, that people had increased levels of confidence and optimism and occupational engagement. So I'll bring your attention to um, the evidence and articles there. And you can, if interested, find out more um, by going into the One Life Tools evidence page and you'll see a pretty good um, listing in case people are interested in all of these um, articles. One which I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about is the qualitative assessment, uh, the qualitative study of our course that I'm gonna tell you about in a moment. So really the framework, if I put it in a nutshell, is a two-step approach. And for individuals, whether they're employees or students, college, high school students, people are saying, what next? How do I move from questions to well-informed choices? And our model is really simple. It's a two-step approach, a step back into clarification using stories and narrative, resulting in a substantive statement document. And that statement then becomes the input into an exploration of your top two or three possibilities, whether it's an internal career move in an organization or something that you might do after graduation, more education, a job, start your own business, and um, we've created a number of images for this, and I like this one in particular, because uh, it shows that clarification is where the power is. It's the back wheel here, fueled by stories, and resulting in some possibilities that the individual then can explore, and their hands are on the controls of that exploration as they move towards well-informed choices. We have a detailed model of this, and I won't go into too much detail, because I want to talk about the implementation of this model using some cool tools, but the, the full model looks like this, and you can find this in a number of our articles, a model for helping people be empowered to take control and proactive in career and life choices. And there's those questions that people bring, what am I gonna do next and how can I get there? And here's people making good choices for the future that they feel confident and hopeful about. Um, and not just for one next step, but for another and another. So we can think about multiple choices across the lifespan. And here's the one step back into clarification using stories and narrative to help clarify things like desires and strengths and influences of others and generating possibilities and using this statement document um, to prioritize a few meaningful, promising possibilities so that you can then intentionally explore them 
by watching for clues, taking action, inspired action, and then being open to pivoting as required. And, and together, these, these three steps of intentional exploration result in individuals making choices. Now, I've implemented this in many campuses across Canada and the US and in organizations. So I'm gonna take you into uh, two different programs at the University of Toronto and then later one organizational application. Um, so at the University of Toronto, we have embedded this narrative framework and the tools that Rich spoke about earlier, the, the Who You Are Matters game and online storyteller into a credit bearing course and into a number of different non-credit programs. And if interested, you can go to the success stories here on the One Life Tools site to learn more about them. So what we did to integrate that um, was to take a syllabus of 39 hours, 13 weeks, and build a program that was really centered around those two steps of clarification and exploration. So together with that and a, a number of other things that we embedded to make it highly engaging and interactive, um, we put it together and I wanted to continue to show students and administrators the impact that this kind of approach can have. So I bring you some results that embed, embedding a narrative framework, um, what can it do? So here's the course, it's actually in the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. So the course is called Engineering Careers, Theories and Strategies to Manage Your Career for the Future. And every term that I've done this course, I've measured pre and post students' clarity, uh, which you see rose by 61%. Their organized thinking, in other words, were they able to put some framework around all the different chaotic thoughts they had, um, increased by 60%. A measure of occupational engagement, how willing you are to explore the implications of your career, it possibilities increased by 21%. And we measured psychological capital that I mentioned earlier, hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism, and it increased by 16%. So again, this was published in, in um, 2019, a qualitative study. And so that was the course, a proper credit course. Not everybody can get a credit course approved in their institution. That is not a piece of cake. So, um, but there are programs and many career centers can implement non-credit programs. So a second program called the Options Program um, was to support grad students um, and postdocs, postdoctoral fellows, to explore non-academic careers. And here again, we integrated this narrative approach uh, with cohorts. We've run about 15 cohorts, um, and, and we've published a paper that got presented uh, for this program as well. And I put a little star next to the connected point of the narrative approach uh, where we did a pre and post survey of participants and note what they said. I can create an actionable career exploration plan to investigate three possible career options and um, pre and post that increased 33%. I can deliver a pitch that highlights the personal value I bring. I can verbalize my goals, aspirations in a career statement. And this bottom one, I can clearly explain my strengths, interests, personal qualities and assets. So the program was actually 10 elements, 10 weeks, and um, this really was three of those weeks. So um, I don't want to say that everything that we found as a result came from the narrative implementation, but it turned out to be very um, well appreciated by those grad students. So how did we do that? The two programs, the course and the, and the um, options program, well, we embedded the framework to help students get clear, get organized and get going so that they would strengthen their voice for self-advocacy through their own education and career options. And more and more, I'm finding students are saying that they want meaningful work and they want their work to have an impact, a social impact. And so what we did to impl implement this was kick off with a group experience um, this is the Who You Are Matters game. Um, we're recording this here during the pandemic. You may not find people meeting face-to-face -face like this. Uh, I hope they do very soon. But we, we have also now created a virtual offer of this group experience for groups of three to 300. But picture a, a group of 25 students or maybe 50 to 100 um, using breakout groups, using Zoom or Blackboard Collaborate. Um, that is followed 
by a self-directed experience that students would do on their own, some homework under an hour for um, self-directed narrative assessment using a web application called Online Storyteller that results in a conversation guide so that we can have meaningful conversations individually or in groups. And then we come back together in a group session for intentionally exploring and supporting the intentional exploration of a startup option, further education, a job in research, whatever it's going to be, a group or individual follow-up. So these are the three pieces that we implemented both in the course and in that options program. So I'll just take you into each one briefly so that you see what each one of these elements are and then, and you'll see how it all fits together. So for the gamified approach at first, we're drawing on the fact that humans are storytellers. Um, storytellers and game players. Games actually predate written language in our human evolution. And so here's an image of 35 students in groups of four or five in a self-directed experience. So wouldn't it be great if people could sit um, with their peers, right? The facilitator, you need a few minutes to kick it off, but really you've created a learning group um, self-directed with four or five players leading to a written clarification sketch. So not only do they have a positive experience, um, but then they have a substantive takeaway. And so when we're facilitating it, um, whether it's in a college campus, as you see here, or in a workplace, and you'll see an image here, there's actually a YouTube, if you go to the One Life Tools YouTube channel, you'll find this uh, video of a workplace. So we've implemented this equally effectively for students, recent grads, uh, workplaces for team building. And when you kick it off as a facilitator, it's really simple. Hey everybody, welcome to the career and life clarification experience of who you are matters. Uh, I need a few minutes pre-game to get you started and then we're gonna play parts one and two of the game in your breakout rooms and post-game I'll pull us back together to share, process and kick off the next step. And it looks really fun. So the reaction we get when people come in and see all of these elements is it looks fun. It looks engaging. It looks like I want to do something. There's this stick here uh, that's a kind of um, fun. Uh, we call it the firekeeper stick. And I'll explain how it works in a second. And people use it as a kind of talking stick and a timer. Um, but when, when students or employees come and look at this, they feel like, wow, this looks exciting. I want to give this a try. Each one of the participants would get a guidebook. They'd write their name on the guidebook. And that's a substantive takeaway that guides the participant's experience. The stick supports storytelling. So we call it the firekeeper stick. Um, when the person who has the stick, um, they're the speaker. Everybody else is listening. So you might even call this a listening wand if you want. Um, because it really supports listening. One person speaks and the other three or four are listening. So you're listening a lot more than you're speaking. And the contents conveniently serve as a timer to provide the structure to balance the vul vulnerability of storytelling with structure. So we have five steps when people participate in the game. They put cards down as step number one. So if you can't see it, I'll just say, cards say I'm practical or I'm detail oriented or I'm dependable or I'm creative. And so participants would look at all the cards and choose three to write in their guidebook. This person has written detailed oriented, adventurous and logical and sensible. Here's the storytelling part, step three. Participants would pick one of their pieces, one of their personal qualities or strengths and say, I chose it because. And it's a really nice experience. So for instance, if you might say, um, I'll give you a quick 30 second demonstration using the firekeeper stick. Um, I chose creative because I love being creative. It really feels good to bring existing ideas together into new ways and create something cool and new, especially when I do it in a collaborative format. Um, like a game or a web application or a new intervention. It just makes me feel great to know that I've created something new that people are gonna benefit from. And that's it. People are sharing these micro narratives with one another. Everybody has a chance to tell a story and then everybody gives one token of appreciation. So we have tokens. Um, virtually, you can just appreciate somebody 
and you might say, hey, Rich, I appreciate what you said about being dependable. That is so important. I really relate to it. And I've been finding more and more dependability is something that I've been trying to um, exemplify myself. And so that sense of appreciation is, we know from positive psychology, people not only feel good receiving appreciation, but giving appreciation gives people that sense of positive well-being, which if you're stressed about your career, a next step is really, really valuable. Um, finally, it's pass and repeat. So we collect the card, move the game piece to the next dot, which would be strengths here. We're going to have a different set of cards. The, the stick moves to the next person who becomes the fire keeper. They then repeat the steps of putting the cards down, writing, saying, and giving. And ultimately, we have a lovely experience of sharing stories and appreciation filling in this guidebook as people participate um, in a meaningful way, generating a possibility for the future, and ultimately pulling all of this together um, so that they have a possibility and an inspired action for something to do next. So in sum, what people get as valuable takeaways from the game experience, first and foremost, is a written clarification sketch. So it's something substantive with three, three personal qualities, three strengths, three in, in, influences of other people are part of the game experience. And you just don't find that in many career interventions, even though we know for students in particular, uh, other people make a big difference. So they walk away with a clarification sketch. We have helped them to generate one specific possibility for their future. Everybody has appreciated and given feedback to one another to support that possibility. Um, they've written one small action to do within the next week or two to get them started and overcome procrastination. And finally, just the experience of sharing and getting out of your head, and especially during the pandemic when everybody is feeling so isolated, you overcome the mental toll of isolation and have the positive feeling, a sense of optimism and confidence from having experienced the game. And so that's one really nice uh, or one set of outcomes from the experience of really having a good experience. As much as it's great and we've watched it over and over again for an hour or an hour and a half or even a two hour block, depending on what we've had, um, what are we going to do next? So students in the course and, and students in options have really appreciated this, but we want to move from that group experience to maintain some sense of sustainability. What's going to happen next? So we want to introduce students to something they can do right away after the game, go home, use this self-directed narrative assessment. It'll take you an hour. And then we're going to come back next week, next meeting, and in, in both the course and an options program, the very next meeting, I would have them bring the conversation guide that came out of the self-directed narrative assessment to our group sessions. And we did offer some one-on-one -on -one half hour meetings as well. So very briefly, the storyteller looks like this. Um, it is a web application that helps you reflect deeper on your stories and experiences, whether that's experiential learning, co-op, internship, practicum, a summer job, in, a volunteer activity. So it helps people deepen clarification. Then with a deeper uh, statement, a career statement, it helps really build exploration plans and accelerate exploration. So briefly, what does that look like? Um, we have a storyline and people could answer questions about their story. So here's an example of, let's say in a workplace, we had a number of people in a workplace and early years went to an undergrad in health science and then a health analyst job and a master's and having kids and a research project manager role and a sabbatical and a research director. That's a workplace example. We might equally have early years, uh, high school in, in such and such a city, um, this summer job, that volunteer experience, you know, this first year of college. So we could adapt these stories for different age groups. And ultimately, when people click on the tell story, they're answering questions about the story that helps squeeze the juice from the stories and put it into a sketch. So I'm sharing about how you use this in a self-directed format. Um, but you can also use this tool very nicely in one-on-one -on -one sessions, which we do in our practice career, career cycles. Ultimately, the content feeds this sketch. So this sketch turns out to be a really valuable intervention. 
a clarification sketch that brings forward all the desires from the different stories, all the strengths from the different stories, all the personal qualities. Um, it integrates those personal qualities from the game experience if they've done it, the interests that they have, influences of others, their parents, a teacher, um, the assets that they bring with them, and ultimately leading to future possibilities that they're curious about. If you do use traditional assessments, the Strong Interest Inventory, MBTI, uh, No Dell Card Sorts, U Science, any of those can be integrated into this sketch. So we could put um, U Science aptitudes into strengths. We could put MBTI personality types into personal qualities. We could take uh, Strong Interest Inventory interests. So we can use this not only as a narrative capture tool, but also to integrate results from other tools. And it's a very simple tool to use. You log in, you access it. Um, we have now consulted with dozens of institutions to help them implement this with their uh, team of counselors or coaches or specialists. Um, and as they go through it, individuals refine that sketch into a statement. Each statement has embedded within it three or more possibilities. And then they can use those exploration plans which have the clues and the inspired actions to, to explore those possibilities. What would it be like if I started a business? What would it be like if I pursued an R&D job? What would it be like if I went back to school to do a postdoc or, or another grad degree? And we did that in group sessions in the course and in the, uh, the options program in group sessions. So that's the summary of it. The outcomes are a career statement. Um, three or more exploration plans, the conversation guide, which you can bring to the, to the counselor, coach, advisor. You can bring it to mom and dad if you want. It has nice open-ended questions for students to use and to bring forward into their conversations with others. So those are the results of the storyteller. When we come back to the session, we utilize all of that in our closing conversation around exploration. So just to summarize, what do we mean by narrative assessment? We mean that it's a story-based approach. Um, research has shown that to be very engaging. Um, it's a qualitative approach, but still structured enough that we have that sketch. Uh, it provides for meaning making out of the context that people bring. And with, with individuals coming from all over the world and their own backgrounds, it provides context sensitive results and it gives a sense of learning orientation. Um, and just different from some of those single dimension career tests that some have, have looked at that, that um, have that sense of matching, you know, that students sometimes are looking for, um, but you just can't stop them from trying to figure out what the match is. Here we generate possibilities without matching. And I'll bring people's attention to this American Counseling Association book. Um, Rich and I actually have a chapter in this book, but I'll bring your attention to postmodern career assessments. Um, because in that chapter, they talk about narrative as a qualitative approach to career assessment and the strengths and weaknesses of it. Um, it ties in with many who are thinking about narrative. And I know many who are, are listening to this presentation will be familiar with the work of Mark Savickas. And just to say that there's a, an alignment here um, with what we're doing as, as the life design intervention constructs career through small stories. And we're on the same page with that of constructing the sketch through st small stories and building that into a statement or a life portrait, and then co-constructing possibilities together that advance that story. So, so that's the summary of it. Um, we have applied this and consulted with many colleges and universities across Canada, the US and Europe. Um, people are using this for high schools, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. Um, organizations and businesses are using this, and I'll just give you one quick uh, explanation of one example of that, a career and employment centers. And we've also been noticing that people 50 plus are considering their next adventure. What might that next adventure be? And the Who You Are Matters experience applies to them as well. Um, I'll just mention this one organizational uh, experience. This was a large, large municipality with thousands of employees. Um, and we used the, the sequence of tools that I'm mentioning, the Who You Are Matters game, the web application, and also a workshop to teach managers how to have career conversations with their employees. And so we did this at the region of Peel. Um, it had a team building element to it. 
employees found it a very engaging way to learn about career management in the workplace. And it was part of a larger internal career development program that included training for managers. I'm sure anybody listening to this who's ever had a career conversation with a manager might realize that, that um, it doesn't go as well as you hope. And we really wanted to support managers to have that kind of career conversation with their staff. So again, if interested, you can find out more um, about all of these applications in some of the success stories that you would find on the One Life Tools site. Uh, we have other educational institutions here. There's the region of Peel, private practices. There's the University of Toronto and a couple of other universities that we've had um, do this. So, so that's it for mine. I'm going to turn it over to Rich in a moment. Um, if you're sparked by this, we welcome you to try the self-directed narrative assessment for free. There's, if you go to onelifetools.com, you'll find that there's a, um, a online storyteller request free credit. Um, and if you have questions, happy to talk to you about that. Uh, and do on the site check out both the newsletter and the blog. We've talked a lot about using gamification and uh, web applications in your in your work. So that's it from me. Hope that was helpful. Rich, I'm going to stop the share here and turn it back to you. Sure. Mark, let's just have you catch your breath for a minute. And I have a question for you. I'd like you to think about you. You have a private practice, but you also do a lot of consulting. When you think about the objective here of giving people voice, promoting social justice, and also advancing advocacy. What's personally been different for you in doing that with this whole movement that you've identified? And what are the rewards out of that? Because think of yourself as a, a person watching this. What did you get out of it personally to shift your whole practice and your own consulting with this in mind? Yeah, I, thanks for that question, Rich. I, I, you know, it took me a while to see the power of narrative. And, and like others, you know, if we do training and you ask people, do you use any narrative in your practice? You see, you see the hands go up. Everybody uses narrative, but what, what we've discovered is a structured way to use narrative so that people can see the results of their stories aggregate into that sketch. And when I watched students or clients of mine, kind of a light bulb moment goes off when it's like, oh, they're on the second story and the third story, and they start to see the patterns. You know, a client who says, wow, every one of my stories seems to have this problem solving pattern. And every one of these stories seems to have an element of one of my parents or my siblings interfering with my career decisions. And when I, when I hear people have that light bulb moment that comes from the kind of conversations that I bet you everybody who's watching this has experienced, we know the power of engaging our clients to tell us stories. But what do you do? Do you just scribble your notes down? Or is there some place that you can move it to so that clients themselves can see the result of the aggregation of their own story come together? And when I saw that, and I remember the first time I actually shared that with one of my colleagues, Leanne, at a university that she and I worked at. And I said, Leanne, I think this process really works. Can I see if you would try it? She was a talented counselor. Would you try this and tell me if it works? And I remember the light bulb moment for her and we had a chat afterwards and I thought, oh, this is a replicable process. Anybody can learn this because Leanne could learn it and it's working for her the same way it was working for me. So it's those light bulb moments when people see the patterns that appear over a number of stories that gives them that clarity to move forward with confidence. Thanks, Mark. And I also know that working with you, your work now is going really throughout North America and also overseas, but it's really kind of, I think, puts an injection into this whole issue of giving people voice and social justice and helping your clients be advocates. And I think that language that you've plugged in today really helps those watching that they could advance their own efforts in that way if they plug into some of your processes and tools. So thank you very much. Absolutely, yeah, great. The strengthening people's voices and giving them the confidence to use that language. I've watched it with students and with options uh, students and, and others, and then hearing it now from the helping professionals who we've trained. And they're hearing now people are making meaningful shifts in their careers because of that ability to do that. Great. So Mark, we'll direct people to One Life Tools and Career Cycles to find your private practice. And we have videos and free training and all things that might support that habit. So let's change habits. Thank you very much. Great. You're welcome. So do you want to turn the screen share on, Rich, and then sure. everybody can see what you're doing? Great. Okay. So folks, I'm going to bring you to another bit of the, our presentation today that relate a little bit more to the way I've been doing some things in addition to working with Mark. And I think what I'd like to get you to think about is 
I'm a university professor having a long career in trying to train counselors, but also really thinking about the value of interest because my own commercialization of ideas and consulting really shaped itself around use of interest. However, I think now I've really grown to think about how we can disrupt basically trait factor work by thinking about a new way to apply the use of technology and also the value of purpose. So I wanna cover two things. I wanna cover youth science and what is going on with that and also the notion of a purpose statement. And I can speak to you from two specific examples. I've used both of these really deeply with what's called the Daniels Foundation, which gives scholarships, full ride scholarships every year to students in 250 scholarships a year for a, a, the length of their college experience in four states. And then secondly, the notion of using it with the National Science Foundation project with really graduate students in science to help them think about aptitudes and also purposes. So my stories will relate to that a little bit more. But some of you may know of use science. It's gone under great growth recently. But for me, use science really shifted my thinking and it complemented work of Richard Bowles and Mark Savickas and now this popular book by Burnett and Evans about designing your, your life. And I think that takes me to think about how do we help people design their life with good information about themselves? What's intriguing is that if you listen to Bill Burnett, uh, and he's got a video on that's quite wonderful, he's at a Stanford, he does a nice job talking about the disservice we do, the kind of way we hurt people just by focus on interests and talking about passions. These quotes, I think, are powerful from his presentation. One is, the notion that you have a passion and that you follow it is one of the most destructive ideas that anyone talks about. I think our industry and much of my work driven by what's your passion, what do you love to do, what are your interests, what don't you like to do, I think has been used many times to track people because it narrowly says what are you exposed to and what do you want to run after in your passion. I love how he says that research, less than 20% of people know their passion and know how to fulfill it. So think about if we just talk to clients about what is your interest, what do you like, what's your passion, and that's typically how most of our sessions begin, and yet most people aren't really clear on their passions. What we find is that their passion is really something you work into, so if we could give people more information about their competitive advantages, where their natural habits are, what are the, the strengths that they naturally come with, that could lead them into kind of chasing opportunities, which would then allow them to find their passion by doing things. And that's where I think youth science has really made a great impact in disrupting the trade factor model. So youth science is a company based out of Nashville and you can see by this schema that it's really beginning with aptitude based gui guidance. And then how do we do academic advising based upon that to give people voice, to give them a sense of social justice about really what are their natural competition, competitive advantage and how do they use that and not get tracked just by their exposure bias, which I think is very much shaped by SES, mother's reading levels, and, and a family's income, and the kind of school they go to. Youth Science now has merged with another company called Precision Exams to form a larger youth science, which really talks about now that we know your aptitudes, can we help you through curriculum, go find programs you need, and then we have certification at the end of it, which demonstrates your skills, which we can lead you to post-secondary education or lead you to employers, because now we can access employers to make that happen. So at the bottom of the page, you can see that youth science has really grown from just an aptitude program to really talk about talent discovery. How do we apply to academic advising? How do we connect to industry credentials? And then how do we connect you to employers looking for those kind of credentials, the documents you have, the kind of competencies that are required for them? One of the challenges I think is that we really have misdirected talent because we really aren't clear on what we've learned in school and what that does for us. We vetted intelligence and talent as GPA and ACT and SAT scores as kind of a proxy for talent, which is unfortunate because we need the best out of everyone. We need everyone's talent. And I think of every one of you, your cousins and children, your partners, they have amazing talent. But if we only use GPA, ACT and SAT, we really miss a lot. So how do we get the best out of all students by giving them feedback about those natural strengths and their competitive advantages? That will really help the economy. I myself have this really almost sense of guilt that I was doing only career development from a perspective of what are your interests. And if you think about most interest tests, and I'm author of a couple of them, is that we really focused on what do you like to do and not like to do based upon your experience. 
which again is greatly impacted by the view you have or the level of, ex of experience you have, which is shaped by SES and other variables. So I think we've done some really harm to only talk about interest with women, minorities, and people in certain geographic areas because their exposure is so limited. And that's why you science says, let's start with really, what are those wonderful natural strengths you have that we can walk crosswalk to the occupations that need those? Now, the science from that, we've talked about theory and research. Some of you may know the Ball Foundation. Well, you science bought all 75 years of research from that, connected with Humro, one of the leading IO psychs groups in the country to say, how do we put this all online to make it technologically based? One of those features Mark and I talked about as consultants. And using technology to measure aptitudes really will be able to make it more accessible to more people and give them feedback with a real interactive kind of interface, which is way different than I was doing simply asking about people's interests. We also did some research in Georgia because the governor there said, well, if we gave this to students, what difference would it make in their emotional and social well-being? And you can begin to see when, we, when you gave this to 51 state high schools in Georgia, we found greater measures of relevance, hope, and purpose in what people were doing about why they were in school and identified their social and emotional well-being piece. So that really said to us, if we give people feedback about their natural aptitudes, it really makes them have more hope it gives them clarity about what kind of purpose they were playing with when they think about planning in their career. And it begins to make a connection between what you're learning and how your natural aptitudes correlate with those and connect to those. Here's where we get back to, I think, the biggest issue about giving voice and social justice issues and how do we help people advocate. So we gave this to 103,000 students in Atlanta public schools, which as you know, Atlanta is a very large urban area. And we asked people to stack their 50 top recommendations. And if you do that for all those students, the top 50 recommendations, 80% of them led to these careers on the left. When you look at their interests, and those are all wonderful interests. We're not opposed to suggesting people explore them, but look at all 80 of those and what that means. 80% of people's interests are related to those areas. On the right-hand side, we're saying, okay, let's look at some specific occupations that are in demand that are high skill, high wage occupations. When you crosswalk those interests of 103,000 people, less than 1% of them led to those occupations. Now, what does that suggest to us about exposure? And people really begin to say what they like and dislike from their experience, and they begin to see occupational stereotypes from rather limited views. So then we stack those occupational preferences by aptitudes, and we found that 20% of, of the aptitudes that are recommended were over on the left-hand side but 54% led people to explore careers on the right-hand side. Now, if I have a daughter, if I come from a resource-poor community or a very deep urban or rural community, if I don't get to see occupations and I only use interest tests, look at what I might be led to on the left-hand side. But if we use you science and find a way to identify, here are things that you have the potential to do, you've measured, we've measured in a performance-based online brain game way, we can get you to do a much better job of looking at your competitive advantages. The summation of that in trying to give people a voice is that interest-based surveys steer students away from the economy if you only use interest tests. And if you look at aptitudes, you're really letting people understand that they have the talent for in-demand high-wage occupation jobs that they might not even heard of. That's where I think we're able to say as a consultant, if you think about trait factor and only use interest surveys, how we really, I think, misguide lots of students. But if we take a look at disrupting the industry to give people a voice and appreciate their own advocacy and social justice, don't we have an obligation to talk about what are the natural aptitudes you bring and how do you crosswalk those to occupation that you might wanna learn more about? Now, I can tell you, I'm not interested at all in tracking. I got a 64 in a New York State English Regents exam, was told not to go to college. So this is not about suggesting you have to do this. It's trying to give you better information to do deeper exploration based upon some good science and say there are things within you that nobody's helped you tell a story about. And let's find a way to look at those, the language to say, where do I find that in myself? Where can I find occupations that let me really flourish using those competitive advantages? So what does that mean for women and people uh, non-majority folks. Well, take a look at this, if you will. If you look at that data again on high interest on the upper left-hand corner, 52% of people have high interest in those occupations in, in terms of female, uh, male and female breakdown, men versus women. 
but when you take a look at aptitude, you increase the potential for people three times, 3.4x times more women can find opportunities in those areas because they looked at their aptitude crosswalk. That's a significant difference. If I have a daughter and you only ask about my interest, I'm gonna fall short knowing about these high demand occupations. If you can help me see my aptitude, you can say, wow, we can find 3.4x more women who have the natural aptitudes, the natural competitive advantages to perform well and succeed in those occupations. The second lower chart is about looking at, if you only look at interests for minority students in key industries versus aptitudes. And 2.1x more minorities have the aptitudes to do these high wage, high occupations that they might not even know about if they only talk about interest. And I've seen that, I think we've done a ton of testing in some large Southern school districts and see how many young people with only looking at interest don't even know what's possible for them. And to me, that's a very much denying them their voice and it's really become a social justice. And that's why I wanna advocate and help them advocate. What are my natural aptitudes? What does that lead me to that no one's told me about? We also at Youth Science can provide analytics so we can crosswalk. Basically, if you have this talent group in your school or county, where do you crosswalk those to what industries need them or what career tech programs or what college programs? And for employers, they love to know in a 50 mile radius, what talent exists that I can go recruit for better training for the occupations I need. And that's an analytic part of youth science that I think is really breakthrough and governors and presidents and deans and CT directors are eating that up all the time. So as a consultant now, I have a way to work with districts to talk about how to work closer with, with industry and decision makers about curriculum and using strong career guidance around aptitudes to help people know their greater potential about voice and what they can do for themselves. In addition, Youth Science is now merged with another company, as I said, Precision Exam, which exams, which creates credentials. So we have all of these tests now that we can test people to document they have the competencies needed to work in these career clusters and so forth. So if we can then say with this talent and this curriculum, and you can test out and show this document to employers that you really have a badge or certificate or credential that you can document these competencies, that's a really great way to give people voice and self-advocate. Here are some companies we're working with who hire graduates with these certifications that can document they have these competencies. And the last one from Amazon talks greatly about, we wanna know how to find technical education, technical talent, and people who can certify that they have the aptitudes that connect to the learning, that connect to the certification, to what are the requirements we need for these jobs. To me, that's a really great way as a consultant to connect all the pieces to get educators, guidance, folks, students, and employers together. Now there's a funny looking guy in this picture and I just would share with you, if we have work on aptitude, which was the second thing Mark and I wanted to talk about with you science, the third is the notion about purpose statements and it's rather a quick self-directed tool you might consider. The guy in the lower left, he's got really big ears a lot like me and he thought about what do I wanna be? And like most young people, we thought, think about the fantasy. Mark wanted to be an astronaut, I wanted to be something else. But what do we wanna be? But then when I go to high school and we really get peer pressure. It's kind of like, how do I want to be? And I think about this picture. This was a night of my prom. It's like, how do I want to be? Because peer pressure was so important. And how do I want to be in the world? And then as I went to college, I got thinking about maybe for the first time, like, wow, do I have the power to design my life? Do I really have the ability to design my life? And what's my purpose? So we put together this kind of purpose statement. We call that purpose and life statement that we find most helpful because it allows a person to self-direct through some kind of self-discovery to talk about their examples. So if you don't mind looking at this chart, you'll notice that, and I'm, you have a copy of this available to you, you'll notice that there are a couple examples of purpose statements. What are your perceived strengths? What are your present activities of interest? How do you evaluate where do you want to have an impact? What are your expressed values that create your design statement? So the upper one, is has a 69 to it because that's my purpose statement. That's how I wake up every day trying to live my life by having done some reflection and filling in the blanks around these topics. The second one is of a 20 year old college student and they talk about their strengths, interest, impact, value, and that, that how this will help them. But I really want you to think about if we could give this self-directed tool to people and give them a language to fill out the third one, an example to you, how would you fill this out? And would this purpose statement, would this life design statement help push you a little bit in a self-directed way to get clarity about what it is you want in life? 
The fourth and fifth examples are also of a 21 and a 24 year old, one, one person in college, one recent graduate, talking about really their own purpose and life statement. So we're giving you a copy of that. You might find that helpful. I think it could be useful. Now, how do you get the language to fill in the blanks? Well, what's interesting is most people have their own language. It's not a difficult mad lib to do, but we also give them some examples and you can make lists of them, maybe letting them choose the words from it. So if you don't have a lot of time, you can just give them lists of words and let them fill in the blanks, or they can do this on their own, but it gives them some clarity about really what is their purpose in life and how do they move toward creating some kind of life design, self-advocacy, to be able to design their own life. And again, we've got a copy available to you for this presentation. And notice it ends though with, this will help me, because we wanna get back into, even if I have a statement, it's really important to get into the psychological piece, like what do I feel, what will I support, how will this help me dream? This will help me in what ways? Because even if we have a purpose and we have a life design, it's probably important to think about how will this help me be more that I wanna be, to be the, show up the way I wanna, show up to keep doing things I love to do. And it gives you a sense of self-directed clarity tool. So that's the third thing Mark and I wanted to talk about. As a consultant, I can give this to somebody, whether in school or in, and in business or organizations, so just take some time and reflect about what's your purpose, what's your life statement. Our intentions today were really to come to you as two folks who've done a lot of consulting, uh, across the world actually. Mark and I've even traveled it's a semester at sea to do career planning of, uh, for young people going around the world on a ship. I mean, it's remarkable when you think and reflect back about our consulting experiences. But our goal here was to say, as a consultant, we wanna think about how do we promote client voice? How do we bring a sense of social justice to our work? How do we help people clarify their next step possibilities, whether they're students or employees? We've tried to touch briefly on the theory and the research and tips useful by looking at who you are matters material, by looking at you science and this simple purpose statement, hoping that you'll learn more or be motivated to learn more, to replicate them both in your private practice and you as a consultant, or if you're working on campus as an internal consultant. So that was our intention. And I'd like to just remind you that who you are matters can be accessible by going to onelifetools.com where you can learn about Mark's individual practice at Career Cycles. Use science is usescience.com. And then the purpose statement, we're sending you a copy. All of those I would wanna have in my toolkit as a consultant and Mark and I use them in most of our work regardless of where we consult. And as we reflect back on NCDA's effort to deliver this virtual conference, it relied a lot on technology. And we think that you think about the power of gamification, utilizing technology, supporting the whole notion of peer support to each other, and including the notion of self-direction. That's the kind of tools Mark and I bring as consultants. So I'm gonna turn it back to Mark to say closing comments and we'll be finished. We very much appreciate NCA giving the chance to talk to you. Oh, that was great. I, I always learn something new when I, when I listen to you. So I, I really appreciated you building the case, um, moving from interest aptitudes when you were talking about youth science earlier and how that moves people toward the economy. And, and I've used that and I've talked to a lot of clients about it. And then with that, with that focus on aptitudes, I, I want to move towards that, you know, that list of strengths that you had when you showed purpose statements, right? And, and you showed a list there. And I'm, I'm just reminded there's so many different ways that people can gain this professional vocabulary. I like that phrase, professional vocabulary, whether it's from a list that might you might provide them from that purpose statement, or whether there's some language that they borrow from you science after they've learned their aptitudes, or from a narrative reflection on their internship or co-op experience. But what, what's your experience there with people? You know, you, you gotta you write it, it's floating around in your head, and then you gotta write it down. But then I think that point about strengthening people, strengthening people's voice and giving them that self-advocacy comes from them you know, having to speak it out loud. So what was your experience going from all of this great stuff from you science and reflection on purpose statement, ultimately to get people comfortable enough to have this language actually come out of their mouth for job interviews, for networking, and then they could write it down in their LinkedIn and resume, but most importantly, to verbalize it to people. What's your experience with that? Well, Mark, what's funny is, and I think it's why you and I like working together so much, is that people have to have a story. 
So if we give them language and they can practice telling a story, once you tell a story, you have a different identity. You really are a new person because you've let the world hear it and you gain some sense of internal confidence. And if you can tie that to internal motivation, think about what that does. Tell a story, get it heard, have a new identity, and then intentionally explore ways to maximize that experience. That's really the goal. And Mark, that's why I think you and I feel so dedicated to this notion of giving people voice. It's really a social justice issue, empowering them to self-advocate, which means we've got to give them language, got them to tell story, maximize the science we can provide them, and intentionally explore to find a way to connect, whether it's LinkedIn or resume or just meeting people to find out people can see the competitive advantages I have to take it to the new economy. Right on. And you, you see people's, like, back to this idea of, like, eyes light up, you know, and people get that moment. Is there, is there either a client experience with you or, or your own personal experience of what you've observed when, you know, when that, that moment happens? Maybe it came from the purpose statement being read aloud. Maybe it came from the game experience or from somebody having done new science, you know, to bring it down to that, the level of the individual kind of getting that and saying, wow, like I've now got that language. I'm able to do that. Well, a quick story. I was one of Richard Bull's uh, early students in what calls you perish. And I remember going through basically identifying my achievements, telling stories, getting feedback, using my feedback group as a resource to think about what I can do. And that was way back in late 70s and early 80s. And then I remember getting very involved with interest surveys and people going, oh, wow, this says I can be an X, Y, or Z. And I go, no, 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 it doesn't say you can be that. It just says you have interest like people who responded like you that day. And then I met you and Mark Savickas, and I really got thinking about the power of storytelling and how that allowed me to make meaning of my experience. And then I made people, you, people use science and said, we have left out the great science we could give people to tell a better story if they knew their aptitudes. And my best story is working in a very, very difficult school in downtown Atlanta and seeing a young person for the first time say, are you saying I could be a this? And he didn't know what the this was. So he found out he had more aptitudes than he even knew, and he could see that it could crosswalk to occupations. He didn't even know what those occupations were. And I, honestly, he and I both cried at the end of that session. That's giving per people a voice. That's really fighting for social justice. That's helping people have a sense of advocacy. Yeah, and, and we've seen it over and over again. You know, I, I remember in a classroom, working through these narrative approaches with students and, and you know, there's this sense, especially for graduating students and maybe some watchers of this, um, of this presentation get it from, you know, what am I going to do when I graduate? And people are just frantically looking at job boards, you know, as if the whole career process is about looking at job boards and trying to find that job and trying to kind of shoehorn yourself into that job. And, you know, that's starting with what's out there instead of starting with what's in here. You know, and I, I remember one of the classes that I was teaching, one of the students said, yeah, you know, a lot of us are just feeling really down and depressed. I mean, he used the word depressed because you look at the jobs and there's so many requirements and I don't think I'll be able to get those jobs. And, and you know, I asked, like, how many people agree with what this student just said? And everybody in the room nodded their heads, you know, and, and then after a few meetings of the class, people were starting to slowly get their voice, find their voice, get that professional vocabulary, learn, you know, and I actually shared you science with them. As you know, I, I had them do that Who You Are Matters game, gain that professional vocabulary, and then plug in other language from different assessments. And by the end of it, you know, that's why I was measuring this, this hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism before the class started in the end. And people were shocked to see that their own sense of hope and optimism would increase. And I think in large part because of that professional vocabulary that's strengthening their voice and ability to advocate for themselves. Yeah, great. You know, I've seen it over and over again. Um, if everybody likes this, let me just point out that there was a recent really good episode of the Career Buzz podcast. And Rich, you were the guest here. Um, this is the Career Buzz podcast. I mentioned it earlier. If you want to listen, you can subscribe for free with your favorite podcast app. And uh, Rich was on this episode along with um, an organizational consultant, Sharzad Ariste, and Mark Danaher, a past president of NCDA. And we had a great conversation. So if people are interested, you can go to the careercycles.com site and just click podcast. So um, that's another follow-up to this session. If you're interested, this is our, our career counseling uh, 
um, company here, Career Cycles. And I'll just finish off with the slide saying, uh, Rich, thanks. It's been a pleasure, as, uh, as usual, to co-present with you. Um, you know, I'm sorry we're not in Minneapolis together to have done this in person, but here we are. And I hope everybody watching wherever you are uh, is appreciating what's available at NCDA and other conferences like it to learn and grow and self-advocate uh, yourself with professional vocabulary. So thanks for uh, co-presenting. Uh, Mark, thanks very much. You've taught me so much. And I also want to bring thanks to Crystal and Kyle. They originally were going to be the storytellers with us to talk about how they're using them at CU Boulder and University of Denver, and they weren't able to be with us. But we have tons of case studies, and Crystal and Kyle are great storytellers of the work we're trying to do to help you think about being a better consultant to advocate for your clients. So, Mark, have a great day. The audience, thank you very much, and we wish you well. Thank you.